Senegem and his family, TT1, Della Medina, West Bank, Luxor, Egypt, North Africa. Senegem lived in Set Mart, the place of truth. That's what Della Medina was called. He was an artisan and possibly a scribe. Egypt at that time was going through a revival. Seti I was king and then later Ramesses II. So they were retaking the Syrian um, provinces which were originally part of Tutmosis III's actual domain. Senegem's actual transliteration name is Senezem, which means the servant in the place of truth. His wife was called Inyafreti. The tomb was a family mausoleum. In many ways, the upper chapel, once it had a, a floor covering, once the mausoleum was completed, would appear just like a niche. And this is probably why the tomb was never robbed in antiquity. So the empty shrine, maybe it had uh, originally a small false door or statue or something, to the passing onlooker would just look like a, sh a shrine rather than uh, a, um, a staircase leading down into a burial chamber. And again, I think that's probably why it was never robbed. So Dela Medina, the place of truth, was abandoned during the, the Ptolemaic period. Remember, during the Ptolemaic period, the latter part of it, um, there were gangs of tomb robbers going round uh, the West Bank robbing tombs, and they were dangerous characters. You also had Libyan raiders. So the occupants of Dela Medina went off to Ramesses III's military temple and made it into a fortress. Then you have the Coptic um, period during the Byzantine where people are becoming Christian and the old pagan ways are, are being destroyed or defaced. So that was going on around Della Medina at, this, at that time. And then after then come the adventurers in the um, 18th and 19th century. So these adventurers were looking for souvenirs and objects which they could mass into collections. At that time, um, Western powers wanted national co collections of objects from all over the world to prove that they had imperialism. So you had lots of these adventurers going around uh, different parts of the world, stealing objects. That's all I can say, digging pits, destroying archeology, span and stealing objects and then selling them to national museum collections. So you have a rogues gallery and we start with uh, Berardino Dravetti. He was an Italian collector and he had very questionable behaviour. So if you got in his way he might kill you. Simple as that. And he amassed collections and sold them to, to um, national governments. So he was a bit, bit of a a robber adventurer. Then comes Henry Salt who was also uh, digging in Della Medina. So these are, they're, they're just digging haphazardly, they're just looking for objects. And he was an artist, a traveller, uh, a collector and also a diplomat. So he had access to these places uh, using his imperial power. Then you have Jean Francois Mimout and he was a French collector and he collected quite a few uh, papyrus rolls and sold them to different museums, some of them in, uh, in national collections now. Then you have Raymond Saboteur, who was again another French collector of objects this time. So he would go out digging anywhere just to find objects to sell to different um, collections. And then the last one on the list who went in as a so-called pioneer was John Gardner Wilkinson who later became Sir John Gardner Wilkinson. His first trip was in 1821. He was 24 years of age and he was really interested in uh, the history but he didn't really use archaeological methods at that time. 
He returned back to England and published his findings in 1834. He was elected to the Royal Society and by 1839 he had received a knighthood um, because of his work on uh, the different sites of ancient Egypt. So what he was actually doing was visiting sites, producing plans and um, pictures and that sort of thing. And that led to, uh, you know, he's one of the first pioneers who actually doing a, or attempting to do a scientific survey. Um, and for that reason, he became uh, a sir. Um, a Sir John Gardner. His second trip was in uh, 1842 and again it was a, an attempt to do a scientific study of ancient Egypt. His third trip was in 1848 and he published several books by this this time and they're reaching out to the general public and trying to connect them with the ancient Egyptians. So this was a fascinating time in the 19th century. You've got the Industrial Revolution, uh, the British Empire and all that sort of business. So people were really curious about other, other countries. And then the fourth trip was in 1855 where he visited Thebes. And that's where he probably started uh, poking around Della Medina. So that's the rogues gallery, as I call it. The tomb was eventually found in 1886 by Egyptian workmen from uh, Gurna. Uh, Gaston Maspero was asked to um, go to the site, TT1, and take control and start recording all of the objects. And he did that. He found, he found that the tomb, the day after it was found, was still intact with all of its uh, original grave goods. Uh, the only thing that did happen that shouldn't have happened was the doorway, the wooden doorway, which was on the entrance, was completely destroyed. Now, this isn't uncommon because when Howard Carter cut the rope of the, uh, of the seal on Tutankhamun's door, uh, because he had a lack of experience at that time with wooden objects, the uh, door was so fragile it powdered to dust in front of his eyes. So it was quite a common thing to um, not take into consideration that these doors were as important as what was in the tomb. I suppose people were getting very excited, you know, these are the pioneer years. Inside the tomb are three generations of family, a total of 20 bodies which were all intact inside their anthropoid coffins with their personal objects which they use in their everyday life and funeral objects which were made for the afterlife. Marta Sura San Julian um, for the University of Barcelona studied this tomb and she produced a family tree of Senegem and published this in uh, 2006. So that was 120 years after the tomb was discovered. So you can see that uh, it takes a long time for any of this archaeology work to reach the public domain. Now then, let's have a look at the pictures in the tomb. So we'll start off, uh, well, here's the tomb plan. We'll start off at two. So we've got Senegen's preserved body with the family below. So think when you look at these pictures, you're looking at, let's say you took a film out of a camera after um, you developed it and you stuck it on the wall. You've got clips, individual clips of scenes which all roll in together. So that's what you're looking at. So you've got a clip below of the family. Um, you've got a clip below of the family in scenes so that gives me the impression that what they wanted you to view was like a film rolling over and so you've got family members um, talking and visiting and adoring uh, Senegem and his wife. At number three you've got the adoration of the gods 
The gods must be adored, they must be respected because you too are going to live with the gods in the afterlife. At number five, so look at the plan, number five, you have the baboons. They are adoring Ra. Now, when Ra uh, journeyed through the underworld, he turned into an aged old ram. Now, there is a story of Ra crossing the sky and he was poisoned by a snake who was Isis. And uh, as he was lying there dying, she said um, uh, in the form of Isis, if Ra uttered all of his secrets of spells to Isis, then Isis would give him the medicine to uh, cure him. So when he traveled in the underworld, he had baboons going before his bark to cut off the heads of any snakes that might be in the underworld. So that's why the baboons are always associated with Ra. And you see them around the bases of obelisks because an obelisk is a dedication prayer to the sun god in the form of Ra Harakti. So that's another place that you see baboons. At five, you can see Senegem and his wife Infreti in adoration to Ra and Osiris. Very important. You've got to um, adore Ra. You've got to adore Osiris. Ra was the one who protected you in your living life. Osiris is the one who's going to judge you, listen to your confession that you have to make before him and allow you if he thinks you're uh, of good character, to go through the duat so you can enter the afterlife. Below is the life you want in the afterlife. So what does Senegem and his wife want? Well, they want to plough the fields of eternity. They want to reap a great harvest all the time. They put lovely scented trees and fruit trees below and then lovely fresh vegetables growing. So that's their dream of their afterlife. If you have a look on the ceiling, you've got a carpet design. So you want carpets in the afterlife as well. So that would be very luxurious having carpets as well in the afterlife. There were multiple pieces of furniture and personal items found in the tomb intact. So I've looked through the uh, lists and I can't find any gold or silver. Silver, supposedly, were the bones of the gods, and gold was their flesh. So gold and silver would be just for kings of Egypt, and maybe a few personal viziers of the king. The treasure is Senegem's family tree, three generations. Wow, that is the treasure. Well done to uh, Marta, Sarua San Julian for her work in producing a family tree of Senegem. That's the treasure. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, this video on Senegem's tomb TT TT1. Uh, if you have, please push your subscribe button, thumbs up, uh, take care. It's bye for now. Let's see you soon.